Come on. Lower third. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, February 28, 2014. We got a lot of stuff to talk about this week. We're going to be talking about Falcon 9, Venus occultations, uh, an update on the spacesuit leak. I'm just looking at my list. I don't have this memorized. Uh, 700 plus planets discovered. Um, updates on the NASA budget. Uh, moon getting hit by a very large asteroid. Not a very large asteroid. The smallest one that we saw. Um, uh, the X flare on the sun. Uh, launch yesterday's launch. GPM and even more. So, um, joining me this week. We've got, last week it was just me and Morgan. This week, it's everybody. So we've got uh, Casey Dreyer from the Planetary Society. Hey, Casey. Hey, Fraser. We've got Dave Dickinson. All occultations. Hey. All the back. time. All the time. All the time. All the time. That's what it seems like. <laughs> Elizabeth Howell. Hey, Elizabeth. Hello. Helping to represent Canada. Oh, Jason Canada. Major. Hey Fraser, who representing New England. Down that he wouldn't be here today. Yeah, this was. I figured I'd play hooky from work and come talk about space. Yeah, but this was you the day we were going to talk about you. There's always next week. Next week, everyone just remember. Just we're going to have to play this by <laughs> ear now. All right, we got Mike Simmons from Astronomers of the Borders. Hey, Mike. Hi, Fraser. And uh, and my partner in crime from last week, Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Fraser. All right. Now, before we get on with the show itself, first, I would like to give a big shout out to all our friends that are currently at Science Online in uh, where are they? They're in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. I know they're having a great time, and I know they were some of them wanted to try and attend the weekly space hangout, but they were just having too much fun. So I know Scott's there, Nicole's there, uh, Matt Francis is there. Uh, I don't know if Pam was there. I think she was sick. But anyway, so everybody else is is there, and I would be there if I had been more organized <coughs> and richer. So, um, <laughs> the second thing is, I just want to sort of send out some support uh, to Miles O'Brien, who has been a contributor in a lot of the projects that we've done in the past. And I don't know if you've heard, but but he suffered an injury uh, in the last couple of weeks and had to have his arm amputated just above the elbow, and I know he's going through a really tough time, and I just want to uh, to give him our support and uh, let him know that we're thinking about him. So, Miles O'Brien, I know you're already using Dragon Dictate, but I hope you uh, you make as, as full and quick a recovery and get back to what you're doing quickly as as I know you want to. So, uh, so get much better more. soon, Miles. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, when I, when I saw that come through, um, it really... I mean, it, I, I was kind of stunned for the for the whole evening after reading that. I mean, when when I first started blogging in 2009, uh, it was some of Miles' this week in space news reports that that really kind of like you know spurred me to get into the whole uh, uh, space reporting thing. So you know to see that this has happened. Now he hasn't done uh, this week in space in a while, um, but still they were great great reports. I mean they were kind of like a one man weekly space hangout all by himself, and he covered all these topics and stuff and interviewed people, and it was great. So to, to hear that this had happened to him and he, he, he'd suffered that was uh, really difficult for me anyway. I mean, I'm sure for a lot of people as well. So so get better sure. soon, Miles. Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. A total inspiration to all of us in the space journalism. He, you know, he was doing what we're doing for a decade before we even even thought it was possible and had exactly. pioneered it with CNN. So, uh, and I know he's... Uh, He's got lots of energy, and this is going to be a minor setback, but it sure is. I've already seen a picture of him moderating a panel on stage someplace, uh, tweeted earlier oh, today. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Glad to see that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, all right, well, let's get moving. So uh, first thing, whoa, what do I want to talk about? I think I want to talk about the planets, because I think that's the big, big story this week, is take whatever number of planets you thought you knew about and just pretty much double it. Elizabeth, what's the story? It's so exciting to see when they come out and they go, there's 715 planets, not possible planets, which is always the way that it goes, but actual real planets. And the way that they're able to do this is through a, a new technique, and essentially what they say is, say you have a bunch of stars that are orbiting near each other, 
and crossing across their paths and dimming the, the path of dimming the light of the stars you would expect to happen with the planet. But if you have a bunch of stars doing it, it's going to be unstable over time because the gravitational interactions of all these big, big things are just going to throw it out of whack. But if you have a bunch of planets that are orbiting a star and causing the light to dim, then it's more likely, just by probability, that it's going to be a bunch of planets that are doing this particular uh, function. And so all of that to say, if they happen to see a star and there's like one thing passing in front and then another and then another, they know that it's a multiple planet system and not a multiple star system. And that's how they were able to confirm all these planets. They went back through all the data. They found these instances of multiple things crossing a single star. And they said, these are actual real planets. And now we've got 750 new ones. And yeah, as you can see there in the graphic, it's just astounding. We've got a 400% increase in Earth-sized planets, 600% increase in super Earth-sized planets, not so much on the Neptune or the Jupiter size, but this just again shows that there are so many planets in the universe that happen to be rocky, that happen to be small, that happen to be pretty close to what Earth is like. And of course the next step would be to find out how many of them are habitable, but we will get into that later on. So I guess that's the question that we all want to know. I mean, with that increase in the number of Earth-sized planets, how many of them are going to be in the habitable zone? So do we have we don't have we have no idea if there's a second Earth in there somewhere? Well, we know that there are four planets that are habitable, and they are in the super Earth sort of range, so about two to two point five times the size of Earth's radius. But we don't know for sure if they're habitable. We're just saying that these particular planets happen to be sitting inside of those zones. So it is a small fraction agreed. But the thing is, they still have two more years of Kepler data to go through. This is only the first two years that they have gone through so far with all this information, all these results. And so once the second half comes out, I mean, who knows what could be in there? And Kepler's not dead anymore. No, that's the interesting thing about that, too. Um, that particular mission had a bit of a setback back in May 2013 when one of its gyroscopes pointing devices failed, and then it couldn't sit and stare at the Cygnus constellation and do its usual thing, which was watching stars and seeing if there were any kind of planets going across it. And so NASA was trying to figure out what to do, and they have a new mission on the books called K2, and what it would, would happen is they would use the sun's uh, solar wind to essentially stabilize the telescope, have it pointing in the same direction for a few months, and then they'd switch it around whenever the sun got a little too close to the uh, telescope sensor. And so if that goes through, that would be rather exciting, but of course there's a budget to worry about. And so we have a senior mission review coming up in about May, and then hopefully by the late spring, early summer, there should be some news about whether that will actually go forward. Fantastic. Or my laser plan, long. more gyroscopes. I, I've noticed most of the, the new Kepler planets haven't hit all the uh, different databases like the actual planet catalog isn't reflecting that yet, that those numbers aren't out there yet. Well, the sheer number of these planets is just overwhelming. We're so used to, as, uh, as journalists and yeah. as astronomers, dealing with candidates, 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 and then to have 715 confirmed planets all in one <laughs> bunch. It's hard for me even to keep writing the word just planet, and I'll put candidate at the end because... I'm not used to it. What it did yeah. was it essentially doubled the number of planets from 700 to 1700. So uh, it's crazy. Do you remember the days when when every new planet discovery was a whole story? Yeah, I do. Yeah, crazy. Now they're bucket loads. So bucket just, loads. Just, just, here you go. Here's more. 100, 500 new planets, 200 new planets. I still yeah, remember planets. 19 1994 getting the cover of the astronomy magazine for 51 Pegasi. I said new. Pl planet discovered beyond our solar system, and it was like cover story then. Yeah, the, the first discovery itself was sort of tentative for like decades, you know, it was, yeah. it was yeah, hard to even know if it was really a planet or not, nobody know, knew quite what to think about it. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, <clears throat> so let's go with oh, Casey. Good news or bad news? Uh, no news, basically, okay. is where we are. So. Uh, there's a couple okay, things. So, uh, Jason, let's no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no news, but plenty. I can do about. that story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the easy story to file. Um, so, well, real quick. So, there's a couple things to look for. So, most people don't follow this quite the level that I do. But next week is when the President of the United States releases his budget request for the United States for the fiscal year 2015. This is the kickoffs of budget season here in the United States and included in that of course is going to be the proposed budget for NASA this uh, next year and then also proposed for the next five years and of course we're going to be very very interested in this so I want everybody who's watching just to keep their ears open for news and reactions from the planetary science budget but also NASA's budget in particular and there's a few key areas to look for uh, there's a few things, particularly the asteroid retrieval mission, 
Uh, this is the first year in which, theoretically, they're going to start budgeting for it. We don't know if they're going to increase NASA's budget or take that money from one place and pay for this asteroid capture mission somehow. Uh, the planetary science budget, of course, has been repeatedly cut over the last few years by the White House. Congress has repeatedly added money back to it. This year, will the White House give up on trying to cut it and accept that people want this to be funded? Uh, will a Europa mission be funded in this White House budget request? These are some major things to look for, and this is all going to come out on Tuesday. So, of course, the society, we get maybe a few hours lead time uh, to start asking questions about the budget, and then we'll start writing about this and having rapid response and information and ways that everyone who uh, lives here and also abroad can reach out to the president and also to their congressional representatives in reaction. Hopefully, I want to say that everyone's going to be writing, thank you very much, Mr. President, for funding planetary science and NASA. Um, I'm not that much of an optimist, That's but we'll totally see what happens. Happen. <laughs> so those are the big questions. Um, then also I want to report on uh, last week I was in Washington, D.C. with the Space Exploration Alliance. Now this is a group of all of the nonprofit space organizations out there, Planetary Society, Explore Mars, Mars Society, NSS. We have this loose coalition that we get together and we, we agree to say, hey, let's go to Congress, let's get as many members of ours as we can, let's do as many meetings as we can in two days to show two things. One, that people support space and they're willing to go to Washington, D.C. We had people coming from Ohio, from Florida, from Georgia, from California, all on their own dime to go to their congressional representatives and say, we want space exploration in the United States. This is crucial. This is a crucial grassroots activity that we do all too rarely in the space community. And you go to Congress and you see how many other people are doing this, not for space, but for other issues. So this is something we're looking to kick up more in the future. So we had 50 people from around the country. We had 105 meetings in two days. We broke up into small groups. We went to our own representatives, we went to people on the science committees and the budget committees, and we all said the same thing. We all agreed on this overall vision for spaceflight. Humans to Mars, humans beyond the moon, robotic precursor missions, we want, you know, technology investment. This is kind of the big picture. I like to think of the proverbial blind man and the elephant. Every organization kind of has a different piece, but fundamentally we're all supporting space exploration and an aggressive space exploration. So that was great. We had a fantastic time. It was exhausting. We got up at 8 in the morning. We are running back and forth between the House and Senate, which is like 20 minutes apart all underground, meeting after meeting after meeting. Everyone was super nice. We had a range of interests, honestly. But the important thing is that people know that, or people in Congress know, space means something to people, and space has political support. And then after that, uh, the planetary, I switched into my planetary society mode and I took, we went with our lobbyists that we have in the planetary society and we met individually with key people about planetary science in Congress. You know, we're all kind of planning and waiting for this budget to come out, but just part of the important process, this is what I think is this new thing that we're trying to build, we need advocates, we need people who are willing to stand up for space. It doesn't have to be planetary science, it can just be space, just say you love NASA to your representatives. This needs to happen if we want NASA to grow so I can stop talking about the damn cuts all the time. So this is the big goal of ours. So that, that happened all this week. It was very good. Uh, we're thinking about doing something in the fall. Certainly we'll do this again next year. And, you know, just keep your eyes open, everybody who's watching, for the, for the NASA budgets next week. Uh, follow along. At, that's planetarysociety.org slash SOS. I'll be writing a whole bunch about it, so it'll be pretty exciting. And so we should look forward to lots of good news on the NASA budget front. Yeah, yeah, you know, if, if you're optimist. <laughs> you know, and, and again, it, it no, won't necessarily all be bad. You know, another thing to watch for is commercial crew. What's commercial crew going to be funded? Are we going to be going to, are we going to get more astronomy or astrophysics research funded? Are we going to have aeronautics and technology? You know, there's, NASA does an amazing number of things. And what we just need to make sure is that we preserve this balance. We want to preserve, make sure everyone's going in the same place together. We had this weird thing earlier this week where the House was talking about this new concept of this Mars flyboy, flyby, basically taking uh, Dennis Tito's concept of Inspiration Mars but making the government pay for it. Um, but that doesn't fit in with any other people's space plans. So, you know, focused effort, focused support for space will get, we'll get the kind of future we want to see. 
Good tap. Casey, did, did did they did they bump that back to twenty one or twenty twenty one? Because I kept seeing that date flying around, and I thought that flyby was going to be in twenty eighteen. Yeah, they did bump it back to twenty twenty one. If they do like yeah. a Venus uh, flyby as well, it's it's pretty audacious. Yeah. And not that we can't do audacious, but this is the same committee that proposed defunding NASA down to its lowest level since nineteen eighty six. And so, you know, in order to do this, they need to make a Mars, you know, a human habitation module to stick on the Orion. They'd have to have radiation shielding. They'd have to have both of those things ready by twenty twenty one. So, you know, th that takes money, and money would have to come from somewhere. And no one's really talked about that in that mission in that hearing. Yeah, because 2018, that's right around the corner, really. I was like, yeah, <laughs> something almost on the pad right now. <laughs> yeah, and that's not going to happen in 2018. All right, well, vote early, vote often. Is that is that how that works? No, don't uh, just I, vote. I understand your 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 uh, American <laughs> politics, but vote. Don't just vote. Contact the people who you voted for. Write write your congressional representatives, people in Canada. Write the president at the White House. Write people at NASA. People in the U.S. write your senators. Call your senators. Go to their offices. Don't just write. This is the big thing. This is why the Space Exploration Alliance was so important. The most important thing, and they've done poll after poll of this, of congressional staffers and congressional offices, the most impact you can have as a voter is showing up in person to either your local office with your senator or representative or in Washington, D.C., and just talking about what's important to you. Very few people do that with space. Now, we got a question here uh, from Christine Grosvenor. Um, Casey, is the Planetary Society prepared to take advantage of the new enthusiasm generated by the Cosmos series? Yes. Yes, we are. Um, that's one of the things. We're, we're actually planning a big Hill event on Capitol Hill in May. Um, we're going to be trying to use Cosmos as an example of, you know, half the things, probably more than half the things that that show will talk about we only know because we put stuff into space to find it out. That's astrophysics and planetary science, the Hubble, the, you know, what, uh, all the X-ray, Chandra, and all the, the great observatories, of course, then all the Viking, Mars exploration, all the things we know about our solar system, most of them we learn by going there directly and looking. So we're working to have a big campaign around it. Um, we're trying to get ready to acknowledge it and then direct what we can uh, and of course, use Bill Nye to try to great, you know, uh, raise this awareness and funnel people's new interest into action, and that's the big jump. All right, well, let's move on. Um, Jason Major, the moon yes, got hit sure. by a gigantic asteroid. Go figure, huh? I mean, they're out there, and <laughs> sometimes, out. sometimes they hit us, but then sometimes they also hit the moon. Now it stands to reason, you know, we uh, our planet gets hit by asteroids. Um, you know, everything from the little everything from the little meteors that that shoot through the night sky when when you're looking at a meteor shower or just glancing up to you know the the big guys like what land you know what what uh, impacted over Chelyabinsk about this time last year or Tunguska you know back in 1908. So we're in a shooting gallery. And and if we're getting hit, then obviously so is the moon, and that's the um, that's the mission of the well, that's that's the the the, the reason the Midas mission exists. Now, what that is is uh, it's it's run by the University of Huelva, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. My Spanish is non-existent, um, and that's in uh, southern Spain. And what they're doing is monitoring the moon with telescopes. And just kind of keeping an eye on what happens on the night side of it. Now, obviously, that's not the far side. That's the moon's night side. So when you have a crescent moon, that's the dark part of it. And, and by, by watching what's happening there in that dark part, they can see if there's a flash. Now, uh, Fraser just put the video up. If you look yeah, right where that arrow is, that was an impact event on the moon that was captured on September 11th, 2013. And... It was the longest and brightest impact flash that's ever been observed on the moon and caught on camera. Now there's there's an initial there's an initial glow of the impact and then the residual uh, the residual heat disperses over the next uh, few seconds. Um, obviously, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so you're not going to get a meteor like we see here. Uh, it's, you're just going to get straight space velocity impact, and it's estimated that this was an object. Uh, maybe a, a few feet across, weighing about 400 pounds, 
Um, I want to make sure I get my stats right. Oop, no, I'm actually low on that. Weighing about 880 pounds, uh, about two to four and a half feet wide, and it's thought that it hit the moon at about 38,000 miles an hour. Now that 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 translates to 61,000 kilometers an hour. This thing is going space speed, and it carved maybe a uh, 120 foot crater on the moon. That's that's what they were thinking. Now it hasn't been spotted yet, but this was the impact. So this news was just released uh, this week, even though the um, even though the event happened last September. That's got to be a high priority mission for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. I mean, that's going to be something they're going to want to look yeah, at. Yeah, right? now I'm not sure if LRO is actually in the type of orbit to to capture that particular spot right there. Um, LRO is going in a, in a polar orbit, so I'm assuming at some point along that along this pathway, it can uh, it can take a look at what's going on there. I mean, I that's going to be that's a that's yeah. a fresh crater. And, yeah, that's, uh, and that's a fresh crater. That's yeah, fresh crater. I mean that'll that's just bring the whole the whole close the whole circle, right? I mean, they'll know they'll have watched the object crash in. Yep. They'll be able to come back around and take a look at what kind of the impact debris is. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. And and the what I, the uh, new, I we knew that we knew that this you know we know the moon gets hit by things. Obviously, it's covered in craters. Uh, but what this tells us is that the the moon actually gets hit a lot more often than we thought. Meaning that. It gets hit, and Earth gets hit. So, so the impact rate on Earth is actually a magnitude higher than previously thought because of what, they're, what the MIDAS mission is finding about uh, rate of impacts on the moon. Uh, Crazy. I, went and, I went and combed through uh, Universe Today's Flickr gallery, and nobody caught it on that date, too. I took a look. It was right around the quarter at that time. How long? And no, there wasn't a virtual star party that night. <laughs> How, oh, no, no. Were we looking at the moon? I don't know. No, uh, I, that's part one of the first things I wondered. I was like, it couldn't have been on a Sunday night. I don't know. No. <laughs> how long what? Uh, oh, I'm wondering how long that like like that was sort of like a bit of a time lapse. That image of it of it you know blowing up. Well, but I wonder see, if, if how long the, it actually would have been there on the moon. And could anybody else confirmed it? I mean, this is. I mean, this event is literally over. It's it fades over the course of two minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, two minutes. Well, so that, that all that, the people that are taking images of the moon, yeah, it, every night, right? It, it was it was during the daytime here. The moon was at first quarter. I took a look, but over in Europe where they they caught the image, it was at it was at nighttime there. So I wouldn't be surprised during first quarter. Usually, a lot of people are the moon's up in the evening. A lot of people are imaging. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody caught it. Over all right. There. Well, if you saw a picture, add it to our Flickr pool on the University <laughs> Flickr pool, and we'll uh, we'll yeah. highlight your story. All right. Well, let's move on. So Morgan. Uh, Falcon 9 can land now? Well, not yet, but they're working towards that. Um, so I got a picture here. When Falcon 9 flies to the space station in... Uh, can you see that? No. I see it. Oh, there it is. All right. When Falcon 9 flies uh, the Dragon capsule to the space station to deliver supplies uh, on March 16th, it'll have these four landing legs attached. Um, and this is the next step in SpaceX trying to solve what's a pretty big problem uh, or a pretty big obstacle in getting into orbit and getting out of Earth orbit and off to the moon and other planets. And that's that it's really expensive. Uh, the Falcon 9, which is a one-use rocket, costs about $60 million to launch. And that's actually rather cheap. Uh, if you look at the Atlas V, for example, that launched MAVEN, that's close to $200 million dollars. Uh, for a single-use, one-launch rocket. And of that, a tiny, tiny fraction is the actual combustible fuel inside. I think Elon Musk at one point said it's a few hundred thousand dollars worth of rocket fuel inside a $60 million Falcon 9. Uh, and just like with airplanes, SpaceX is thinking, can't we reuse the rocket and just refuel it up? Um, and so over the last couple of years, they've taken steps to return rockets that are in flight back to the Earth in a safe and controlled manner. And you probably remember seeing some of these uh, grasshopper videos over the last year where the rocket takes off and goes up a few hundred meters and just kind of hovers there. And they move around, move around, and then it lands right back down on the launch pad. And eventually they're hoping that's what will happen with these big Falcon 9s uh, once they've delivered their payload into Earth orbit. But that's tricky, and it's one thing to come down from a few hundred meters. It's another thing to come down from, you know, 
100 kilometers. Uh, you're going to have a lot more energy. You're going to have a lot more um, forces on the rocket that you need to get under control in order to land. And so they've been slowly working on this. And in the last couple of launches to the ISS, they've practiced restarting the engine. So they, the rocket goes, the engine's going, going, going. It cuts off at the right moment to give the Dragon capsule the right orbital velocity to enter Earth, Earth orbit. Uh, but then the rocket starts falling back to Earth. And as they do that, they turn the rocket back on, start firing the engine again, and that helps slow the rocket down as it falls back to Earth. The problem that they've been having is that the rocket starts spinning out of control along its long axis. And what that does is it cuts off the fuel supply to the rocket and it causes it to behave unreliably. And so these landing legs, in addition to eventually landing, uh, supporting the, the rocket when it lands on the ground, uh, are going to help act sort of as wings and stabilize the, the rocket against the rotation of falling back to Earth. So they won't be landing, like, right now on, uh, on land. They're still going to be falling back into the ocean until they can prove complete control. But they're hoping to do what they call soft landings on the water, where they basically fake landing on the land, but instead are hovering right above the ocean surface. And that's not going to happen in this March 16th landing, but that's what they're working up towards. And once they can prove they do that reliably, then we can start talking about landing these rockets back on land and refueling them for, for other missions. And SpaceX estimates that that could save uh, or reduce the cost from uh, $60 million to less than a $1 million per launch. If you guys so haven't seen this video, talking. yeah. I mean, I've got a. I pulled up the 744-meter uh, uh, grasshopper test. If this will play, it's really cool. I mean, so how much of the rocket that is going to be reused? So that the whole what the whole bottom stage is going to be able to return to the launch facility? That's the that's the intention. Uh, is that the whole the whole first stage of the rocket will uh, sort of drift back? Right now, it just kind of falls, plops back into the ocean. Uh, the hope is that they can return that whole part uh, to the launch pad, and presumably there'll be some pieces that aren't reusable, um, and that they'll have to make some mission-to-mission uh, -mission, uh, repairs and things. But the overall integrity of the, the cylinder, the rocket body, um, should be intact enough to basically fill it up, because most of a rocket is just a fuel tank. Mm -hmm. It's basically a fuel tank with a little motor on the end that blasts that fuel out out the bottom and pushes the rocket up. And so that big part that is the fuel tank, um, you know, that's the majority of the rocket. And as long as that stays structurally intact, they will be able to, they're hoping they will be able to reuse that uh, and dramatically cut down the costs. It seems crazy to me, I mean, not being an aerospace engineer, that they're not relying on parachutes and other ways to slow the descent before you'd want to kick in the rockets and have it do the final the final descent. Like it seems like there's other ways you can slow a rocket down well, as that, it's returning that to That may Earth, be right? their intention uh, to parachute down, but in order to, to land, you know, they need to land, in order to save this, they need to land upright. In order yeah. to land upright, they need to have some attitude control in terms of where they land. Uh, and that's what the grasshopper was designed to uh, prove is that once you get down close to the surface uh, and you're moving at a slow speed, the rocket is accurate enough. Uh, and controlled enough to maneuver and land, you know, right on the X on the launch pad. Um, it, yeah, I mean, if he can crack the, I mean, you know, Elon Musk said it's like flying in an airplane and destroying your jumbo jet every time you take a trip. And so if we can get to that point where you can actually take off in these rockets, all reuse all the parts and just deliver the payload into space, it'll be... It'll be phenomenal. That will be the big revolution in space exploration. Right. And that was the idea behind the space shuttle. It just it never fully came to fruition. They reused the solid rocket boosters on the space shuttle, but that big main fuel tank, the big red foam-covered thing that you see in all the pictures, that fell back to Earth and was destroyed. And so they had to rebuild that uh, every time they wanted to... Uh, to launch a new space well, shuttle, and they had to do a heavy amount of rebuilding on just every orbiter. I mean, they, you know, they're half. They were half billion dollar launches uh, each time. So they, right, they, if that was the goal, they were nowhere near it. All right, well, let's. Uh, but I'm terrific. I can't. I can't wait to see the first fully reusable rocket. It's. Uh, it sounds like Elon Musk yeah. is is Fingers really. Crossed. 
going for it. Um, okay, Dave Dickinson, I know that you uh, want to talk about occultations. You said you want to talk about it twice, so what's the news on the Venus occultation? You're muted, by the way. <laughs> I'm David Dickinson, and I'd like to talk about occultations. There we go. I think I'm off now. Yeah. All right. Yes, there was a there was one of the better astronomical events, observing events of this month and of this year. Uh, there was an occultation of Venus this past Wednesday for viewers across northern Africa and southern Asia, and we got some pretty good uh, videos and images and everything. We did a pretty good roundup. Our friend, the uh, the daytime astronomer over in Malaysia, Sharon Ahmad, went and did an expedition actually up toward the Thai Malaysian border to catch a grazing video of Venus along the limb of the moon that I thought was kind of cool that he actually got. And he had some pretty interesting stuff out there on Google Plus that he shared too. This is one of two occultations of Venus by the moon this year, but the second one is going to be so close to the sun that it's not observable. The second one's only a degree from the sun. So this one, Venus is very near greatest elongation right now, so it was very well placed. I was out imaging Venus Wednesday morning because the rest of the world we all saw a pretty close pass. We saw a pass within a degree. Uh, Europe, there was a lot of good images. We got images from Africa. We got images from Europe. We got images from Asia. We got images from North America. And there was some science to be done on this, but nobody took me up on the challenge of seeing the, uh, we talked about the mystery of the ashen light on Venus, whether it's actually a, a real phenomenon or an observer illusion. And I pointed out, Somebody actually pointed out to me, and we're talking about being able to see that dark limb of Venus come off the dark limb of the moon. However, you would have had to have been in North Africa at a very pre precise point to get it, and to my knowledge, nobody actually tried it. There is another occultation up in 2015 that somebody could possibly do this from the outback in Australia. So uh, beyond just being pretty pictures, it would be something kind of cool, too. I noticed also... There are a lot of flags have the moon and star, crescent star on it, this kind of, yeah, this was an observer in India shot me these. I put these together for him. He shot, he had a Flickr page. We had all a sequence, and I actually stitched these together for, uh, for him where he actually caught in India, in Bangalore, where he was, he actually saw Venus go behind the limb of the moon, or the bright limb of the moon, which I thought was kind of cool because you can see they're both in a crescent phase. So I thought it was kind of nifty that he actually caught that. So you've got actually the second and third brightest natural objects in the sky next to the moon in, in the same image. I did some historical research on why a lot of these countries have uh, stars and moons. Like they have this, this kind of representation, like the Turkish flag is always the one. And the Malaysian flag has it too, Sha Sharon was pointed out. We have the, the moon and a star on the same flag, kind of like a simulation of an occultation. And apparently it goes back to the, the Battle of Manzikert. There was a certain sultan in August 26, 1071 AD, and I did a little bit of exclusive Universe Today research on this, simulating the, that date and that position, what you would see from Turkey. And actually, there was no bright star occultation anywhere, or planet for that matter, around that date. So I wonder if it's kind of an apocryphal story. I've never seen it really searched from an astronomical perspective for the Battle of Manzikert from, from that point. And I know I've researched uh, a few times about uh, UFO sightings of bright objects near the moon. There was an instance in 1589 in St. Denis, France, where they said that they saw in the daytime a bright object near the moon. I have simulated that in Stellarium. I don't know if anyone's ever researched this before, but that, in fact, was Venus near the moon, almost definitely, because it was very close. You can see Venus in the daytime, and a bunch of us were trying to do that Wednesday after the occultation, because you've got the moon right next to Venus. It makes a very good guide. And Venus is surprisingly, when it's near greatest elongation, very easy to see next to the moon. So it's kind of a neat thing to do. Right on. Uh, and so when's the next good one we're going to see? 15, 2015? The, the next good... Uh, uh, 2015, there is one that's observable from Australia in the South Pacific on July 19th, and there is a good occultation of Saturn. There are 16 planetary occultations That's my favorite this year. one, is the, is the Saturn yeah, occultation. There, there, there was one. We're in a cycle of Saturn occultations right now. The moon, it lies right along the path of the moon, so there's, I believe, 14. Every, uh, I think 12, there's like every lunation this year, the, the moon is swinging by and occulting Saturn. There's one that's going to, it's going to occult Saturn for South America and Africa on March 21st. And so here we'll see a close pass. Uh, we won't see a, an occultation from North America, but we'll see a very close pairing. Probably be able to get some pretty good images. I think the moon is very near full that, 
it's waning, waning gibbous, I believe, it is looking at the chart. So, yeah. Cool. So, the other one that's really neat is Jupiter because you can have up to four satellites being occulted at the same time, so you yep. get five for the price of one. <laughs> yeah, you can see those, those so moons I, poke I, out the side of the yeah, moon. It's, yeah, it's cool. great. Ironically, yeah, I, Jupiter, Jupiter is the only naked eye planet that does not get occulted by the moon this year, ironically. Sorry. But it is cool to see. Anyway. I know. Yeah, yeah and I think it's important to understand. Nope. Like, uh, you can really see the how the geometry of the solar system works out because the occultation is visible to people at various parts of the planet because of where you are compared to the angle of the moon and where the the angle of the of the planet is. And so, uh, so you you know you mean Shaw needed to drive a couple of hundred kilometers north to be able to actually just see to the catch occultation. It. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just bear. Yeah. I, thought, I thought it was cool. He actually mounted a little expedition to go get it too. And uh, what's even weirder, in the, the second total lunar eclipse this year in October, the moon is going to be occulting Uranus for some areas in the northern Pacific during the eclipse. That's kind of very rare. I'll be, I'll be writing about that more, I'm sure. But that's, that's extremely rare to have a, an occultation during a lunar eclipse. Yeah. That that would be crazy. But he, there's there's a page on Wikipedia where you can run. They've run all these simulations and times you get like double yeah. occultations and things like that, where you get and you know Jupiter pass in front of Saturn while it's all passing in front of the Moon and things like that. Yeah, yeah, a double planet. That's even rare. <laughs> yeah, every we couple have, hundred thousand we, years. We yeah. have a, a very bizarre occultation coming up on March 20th for people in the tri-state area. The asteroid 163 Aragon is going to be occulting the star Regulus. For Whoa. like, I think it's like a dozen seconds. Or you'll be hearing more about it as we flip the calendars over to March. It's one of the the, the bigger astronomical events of the year. But you would I'm actually see Regulus dim in the sky, out. right? Yes. This is this is one of the brightest stars that's ever been occulted by an asteroid. So it's going to be a big event. That's really cool. We've got to do that live. Um, <laughs> we need somebody right. in the New York area. Or, well, I think we know people in the New York area. Um, yeah. All right, let's move because, on. Uh, because I like I like such things. I like to add in a little bit of trivia there. The uh, uh, when when the moon occulted Venus, it was the the two bodies were seventy four million kilometers or forty six million miles away from each other. I think that yeah. type of stuff is cool because it just shows you know and that's it's there that, and there it is. That, that term occultation is one that just makes people turn their... My non-astronomer friends are almost sure I'm actually an astrologer when I talk about it. <laughs> right. Uh, is, is Mercury in retrograde? <laughs> uh, what house right, well, let's move on. Um, Mike Simmons, we've got uh, a way that we can... I think we're naming craters on Mars. What are we doing? Well, we're doing all kinds of things. Let me share this here. So we can see it instead of me. And uh, so the organization Uingo, which is fairly new, they have a new website. This is it. They have had a program going on for some time here that you can name exoplanets for a small fee. It's caused a lot of controversy, but they're raising money, as it says here, to create new ways for people to personally connect and to fund uh, space organizations. These are planetary scientists who are doing this. So this is professionals finding another way besides NSF and NASA to help fund research that is getting underfunded, as well as other organizations like mine and some others that are doing good things. So they had this uh, project up here for doing, uh, suggesting names for exoplanets now, and they have adopted a planet program as well, but they just announced this one. There are 500,000 features that have been identified on, on Mars, and so far 15,000 of them have been named, and they've all been done by people who happen to be driving uh, rovers around on the planet's surface. So they've given you a chance to be a part of Uingo's own map. I won't even begin to get into what the IAU might have to say about this, but <laughs> right. you know, this, is, like this is all for a nonprofit that's putting, raising money, want to raise millions of dollars to be able to do some of the things that uh, Casey and Planetary Society and others would like to do. And they have to keep going to Washington with their hands out. So this is a way to crowdsource actual research. You can see here, I don't know if these are real names or not, Sarah's Large Hole in the Ground, that's a big crater there. Uh, I, I hope these are uh, just uh, sample names, but I would highly recommend going to Uwingu. You can see how it's spelled up here. It's uwingu.com. Check this out. Check out the other things that they're doing. They have a big uh, drive going on right now. Anything that you put in here, it starts at just a few dollars. I think $5 for a little crater and uh, more money for larger craters, and they've, they've got other plans coming up. This is a great place to support and have fun 
don't, don't buy a star from a commercial company. Put yourself on the actual map that uh, Uingo is creating with these public names. Uh, give a gift to somebody for their birthday or something else. And uh, so I, I, it's it's a great program, and I, I hope they're very, very successful at raising lots and lots of money with this, getting a lot of attention. And you know, you I, get the Uingo button. Oh, do you? <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. Cool. I wish the IAU would take this a lot more seriously. Like, they have been pretty sticks in the mud. Like, if there's ways that we can directly fund the exploration of space, planetary exploration, in exchange for naming rights to things like that, I think that's totally worth doing. I think the, the concern is, as you mentioned, there's these star companies that no money is fun, is going back to anything. They're just updating their database with the, your name of a star, and it's not being recognized, and they're not keeping the money. So this is yeah, a public program, program. program, and whether or not anybody uh, that, that's considered official recognizes it or not, I don't know how that'll shake out. But this is up and up. This is uh, real, and if it's a public map and it's it's things that we're doing, uh, you know, maybe some of them will stick, maybe some of them won't. But they've already uh, nominated names for exoplanets based on this, and there are a lot of planet uh, discoverers who are behind that as well. So. Uh, it is, I agree with you, that there has to be a way for astronomy to be more relevant, to be, be more participatory, and to get people to understand what's going on and, and provide support. And they're doing a fantastic job of it. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we're going to move on. We've got a few more minutes. And I know Elizabeth has been following the space leak that happened with Luca Palmertano uh, about a year ago and has some updates and information. So what's the new news, Elizabeth? Uh, this week they released a 222 page technical report describing all the different causes that went into this and like any kind of spacecraft crash or sort of aircraft investigation you can understand that once you start to pull on a thread the whole ball begins to unravel so trying to summarize all that information in a few news stories even is quite challenging but what I'm going to do here is just focus on one aspect that surprised everybody which is that this kind of leak actually happened in the same helmet in the same spacesuit the week before and what happened was uh, they were finishing up the spacewalk. They took off. He, Luca Parmitano, who was wearing the helmet, took off his helmet, and he noticed that there was about a liter of water in there. And they couldn't quite figure out what was going on, but they thought that maybe because he had his head down while they were doing the depressurize, the repressurization rather, that he had somehow activated his drink bag and that the bag had leaked water in there. And so apparently there were some conversations between the crew and the ground, and everybody just came to the conclusion that it must have been the drink bag. Well, as history shows, that's not exactly what happened because when he went out a week later, the leak just got worse, and it turned out to be something to do with the uh, the airflow, the, sorry, the flow valve inside of his uh, his backpack. So they're still working on what the exact cause is, but the point is, it did happen before, and basically the report is saying that NASA just took too cursory of a look at the situation and kind of accepted a half investigation into the matter, and then just went ahead with the next spacewalk, and that I think was the part that really, really worried everybody. They're but calling it still... misdiagnosis, which is actually a pretty, a pretty bold, uh, a pretty bold, you know, uh, moniker for the whole thing. Is, you know. Yeah, the fact that they're having trouble digging up, you know, where that liter of water came from is, <laughs> it's kind of amazing. So has this spacesuit, the helmet, been returned to Earth then for study by engineers there, or is this still all being done by astronauts in orbit? It's still being done by astronauts in orbit, and actually that's a whole other aspect of the report. They're basically saying there's only a limited number of suits available. This is not an aging issue. I should emphasize this. This is not an aging issue. However, the suits are certified for up to six years on orbit before getting a major checkout, and basically they're questioning that process, saying that maybe we should be looking at this a little bit more often. And then the other problem they have is that there's hardware in orbit, and there are people on the ground, and the people on the ground are trying to do this investigation. They can't even access the actual stuff that was involved in the, uh, the, the situation. And so another thing they call for in the report is a more expedient way of getting parts up and down on the various spacecraft. And it is slated to come back to Earth on a SpaceX flight later this year, but by that time, you know, probably almost a year will have passed because it was back in July. So you can imagine just how difficult it is for anybody to do an investigation when you've got a crew in orbit, they've got all this other science and other duties to do. They had an emergency spacewalk back in December. Meanwhile, there's a spacesuit that really needs to be looked at and to try and figure out what's going on. So, uh, yeah, overall, it's a very serious situation. Now, the next thing I'll talk about quickly is the remedies. Um, essentially, they have 49 recommendations in this report, which I'm not even going to try to go through. But to kind of bring them out into different priorities, they have priority one, two, and three, with one being the most urgent and three being the least. 
and NASA has pledged to actually clear the one and two recommendations before any kind of spacewalk, any kind of normal spacewalk takes place. And they hope to have this all done by June. And I asked them if they had any kind of pressing spacewalk tasks to do between now and then or even a little bit after then. Like, for example, when they had that emergency spacewalk back in December, they put the, um, the broken pump into sort of a temporary location. And they said at the time, well, it can sit here until summer when we can take a look at it and make a couple of adjustments and put it in a more permanent spot. And apparently they've, they've done some other analysis since then, and it can sit there for many months more. So that's not a problem. So uh, they're saying that, you know, unless something breaks, they're not going to be sending anybody outside until at least July or August, depending on how quickly this investigation gets uh, gets worked through and all the recommendations and all of that. Uh, so we're getting a little short on time, because I actually want to wrap this up at 1, because the uh, our good friends uh, at Space Fan News, Tony Darnell, they're going to be doing their Hubble Hangout at 1 p.m., and I know that a lot of people will want to jump on over and, and see that. So we've got about another 7 minutes left, and then we'll sort of usher you into their uh, into their hangout. Um, the uh, So a couple of things then. One was we had a launch yesterday, which I know a lot of people were watching. Yes. So GPM, Core, GPM Core satellite, uh, Global Precipitation Measurement Satellite launched out of Tengashima, Japan. This is a joint uh, JAXA-NASA mission, which I thought was kind of cool. It was a night launch for them over there, so it was a very brilliant night launch. And this is going up to uh, do measurements so it's Earth observing satellite, not in the A train of usual satellites like Aqua and, and those uh, series of satellites, but this one is going up to measure uh, global precipitation worldwide. There was also seven secondary payloads on there. One I thought was interesting, it might be interesting for amateur sat observers, is called uh, Shindai Sat. That's actually doing a test of LED communication technology that when I read through the press release, they said should look like a flashing second mag negative second magnitude star. So when they're actually testing it. I don't know how how long or how many passes they're going to do of it, or if they're just going to pass over certain observatories and do that. But I was like, that'll be kind of interesting to see. So It was a pretty big payload. It was an interesting like one a, to watch. I'm trying to remember. It was like a 7,000. Yeah, it, it, gener it, gener it, gener it generated nine objects. Of course, GPM core was the largest one, and then there was the H2A second boost stage booster that's up there. And on NORAD, like I said, there were seven smaller CubeSats. The International Space Station is released. I lost count. There's been like a couple dozen. Uh, I just lost count looking on NORAD Space Track how many CubeSats have been launched this week in this past month. They've sent a, a bunch of CubeSats off the ISS. It's a few dozen at least. Yeah, well, remember that, that couple of weeks we had where there was dozens of spacecraft launched and then a week later dozens more that was just... Yeah, many, many more yeah I, I, one of the places I'm checking every few hours is NORAD Space Track, and, and I, I'm looking to see if any new ID, object IDs are getting put in there, and it's been, I haven't been able to keep up that this month, it's been so many. I saw some local news, there's uh, Brown University here in Providence, um, their, their students are working on a similar CubeSat with, a, with an LED on it, and I think they're going to launch next yeah. year, and it's going to do the same thing, it's actually going to have a, a flashing light that'll be visible uh, over the Providence yeah. area, and then the students will do whatever research they're going to do on that. So that'll be like cool. That'll them. be cool. One of the ones yeah. that just went up uh, yesterday, uh, SkyCube, that you can look up, is going to uh, inflate a bright balloon at the end of its yeah. lifetime and drag yes. it back down in the atmosphere to burn up. But while that balloon's out there, it's going to be very bright. That should be visible, too. Yeah. And, they're, and they're putting a LIDAR mission uh, up on the International Space Station that's going to be, so on shadow passes, on night passes to the International Space Station, there's a possibility, like the Calypso satellites, you'll see this LIDAR being used. So I love that the just the barrier to entry to doing a satellite is coming down, and so you can literally, if you've got a great idea, you can get a CubeSight launch that will, that will let you test out your ideas. You don't have to go through all of this uh, big expensive process anymore you know and there's even like micro cube sets they take cube sets that contain <laughs> slices of little cube sets that are just like as, as big as a circuit board and and so it's, it's like amazing Russian you can nesting satellites yeah, you yeah. nesting Russian nesting sounds that you can put camera <laughs> orientation transmission systems all of that on a, just an absolutely miniaturized thing it's a, one of these wonders of the iPhone be, uh, you know portable phone a lot, of them are, a lot of them are based on the Android operating system like they, they actually are based on the same thing we're carrying around in our pockets so yeah. Uh, did we get all of them? Okay, David, I'm going to give you one more, and then we'll see if this, if this wraps it up. So just we had a big flare, right? 
Yes, we did Tuesday. There was a X 4.9 flare. It was a new sunspot group. Actually, it's an old one. It's a remnants of uh, active region 1967. Since it's rotating around, it's been redesignated 1990, but it's the same sunspot group. Came around the solar limb on Tuesday. It kicked off uh, X 4.9 flare. What it kind of gave our Earth's magnetosphere a glancing blow, but there were there was uh, reports of the. the Estimated planetary K index jumped up last night to about six or seven, which is above storm levels. And I saw a lot of photos going around from the UK, and I know Nancy did a lot of good of, pictures. Uh, yeah, of Aurora. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, I don't I didn't see as many from North America, so I don't know if many Northern Tier viewers might have been clouded out or or whatever. But I didn't see as many photos come out of North America as they did from yeah. the UK. But they saw a lot of Aurora over there. I think yeah, we was down over the UK more than North America looked like. Yeah. Yeah, no, we had some great shots on the Flickr poll. So, again, if you do a search for yeah. the Universe Today Flickr poll, if you go to Universe Today, it says photos at the top. If you click that, it'll take you to the Flickr poll. And right now we have about, what, 14,000 pictures in there. But yeah, the last, yeah. it's amazing. You can see whatever is the big event because it is, it was, it's all auroras right now. Last night's storm. Last night's storm subsided, but um, that, fl- that, that active region is just rotating into view. So it may kick off some layers. It's the third right, well, time around for this active region too. I mean, it's it's yeah, already yeah, it it's is. already done a done three row three rotations. Yeah. How many times? How many times has it thrown out blasts That's of radiation new. into space? Um, okay. Well, why don't we wrap this up then? So we'll give uh, our our good friends over at uh, Deep Astronomy a chance to take over the internet. Um, so, uh, Casey, where do we find out more? Planetary.org slash SOS will be the section for all of the space policy news and budget news coming out next week. And Dave Dickinson. And regular. I am um, Universe Today com, and I will probably be doing a quick rant post about switching over to daylight savings time next week. So. Have you not destroyed <laughs> daylight savings time yet? <laughs> not yet. Not wow, yet. you will. Elizabeth, okay. where do we find out more? At Howell Space, uh, which is down below in the lower third, and uh, I write for various places. I'm a senior writer on Universe Today. I work for Astronomers Without Borders, and uh, Space dot com, and a few other spots. So. Check me out there. Jason Major. I'm at lightsinthedark.com. I'm on Twitter as J- JP Major. I'm at Universe Today and Discovery Space News. Uh, all good stuff. Space all the time. Mike Simmons, where do we find out more? Well, I'll just talk about Uingo this time. They need the attention. Uh, it's a wing with a U at the front and a U at the end, dot com. Uingo. Since Mike won't do it, I will do it. You can find him at astronomerswithoutborders.org. And uh, and you've got the big uh, World Astronomy Month coming up uh, soon. Soon, one month, and uh, yeah, we have news about that for uh, new programs and things. Maybe I'll talk about that. So. All right, and Morgan. Yeah, the website's cosmicchatter.org. We're on Twitter at cosmic underscore chatter. And if we didn't get a chance to answer your question during the show, I'll be heading over to the. Uh, Google Space Community to a Google Plus Space Community to take the rest of your questions about all the things we just talked about. And so just to reiterate that, so if you go to Google Plus, you do a search for the space community there. There's about 110,000 people in the space community or more, I forget. Um, 170,000. 170,000, awesome. yeah. And um, Morgan will uh, will hang out there and answer lots of questions about, about space and astronomy until uh, you've had your fill. And uh, we really appreciate Morgan Morgan fulfilling that that service. I think it's a great idea. i got to think of some way to channel more people at this. So, um, Cool. Well, once again, and I'm Fraser Kane. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at FKane. Uh, Universe Today is my website. We just wrapped up another week of filming. We've got eight more episodes that are in the can, and we'll be uh, unleashing them on the YouTubes over the next uh, month. Some pretty silly topics this uh, this time around. We went a little weird. I will I will admit it. So uh, so hey, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks to the entire panel for joining us. And if you haven't already, do a search for Space Fan News Hubble Hangout on Google Plus and watch what they're doing next. Tony Darnell, Scott Lewis, uh, good friends, and uh, you'll get lots more information on the Kepler discovery. So thanks everyone, and uh, we'll see you all next week. <laughs>